Hello, this is Dr. Kevin Flaherty from the University of Michigan. Welcome to this educational activity on progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Progressive Fibrosing Interstitial Lung Disease, Shining a Light on the Latest Clinical Advances. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash FMH. Downloadable infographics and additional resources are also available. The objective for this presentation is to review the concept of progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. It's important to recognize that this is an evolving concept and not yet a defined disease or entity. And at present, there are no approved therapies to treat progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. In trying to review this concept, we'll walk through some of the evolution of the diagnostic process of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and draw some similarities between idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and some non-IPF progressive interstitial lung diseases. If we start to talk about the PFILD concept, we can look back historically. Historically, we grouped many different types of interstitial lung disease into a general category and called them pulmonary fibrosis. This meant that within those categories, there were lots of heterogeneous patients, there was lots of heterogeneity, and it made it difficult to study. There may have been some patients within that group that responded very well, others that didn't respond at all, and when you looked at them all together, it appeared that there was no efficacy to the therapies that were being studied. We can look back several decades to retrospective data looking at cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This retrospective study started with 220 patients, 143 happened to be treated, although the treatments were variable dosing and duration, and it was an even smaller subset, 127 patients that had detailed and only 78 that had complete follow-up. But in those patients, there were some that had response to therapy. 57% of them had subjective improvement, they felt better, and a much smaller percentage, 14%, had objective improvement with responses to dyspnea scores, lung function, or improvements on chest x-ray. But when you looked at this large group of patients about the factors that seemed to be associated with response to steroid therapy, those were patients that were younger, less symptomatic, and had a biopsy characterized by more cellularity and less fibrosis. If we think what we might have called those patients if we classified them today, we would not have called them likely idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We'd likely we would have called them nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, which we know now does have a higher response rate to steroid therapy. So this retrospective study highlights that within a large group of patients, we were starting to identify subsets that seemed to respond to therapy. But if we looked at them as a whole, they may not have shown any responses. Certainly, the patients that had response to therapy had a better prognosis than those that did not respond. If we move forward and we look at a much smaller but yet prospective study of 41 patients with pulmonary fibrosis, Within the subgroup of patients, there were some that were stable, some that responded, and some that didn't respond. That response was defined after three months of high-dose steroid therapy and was based on changes of clinical symptoms, physiology, and radiographic scoring. When this group of patients was looked at in more detail, there were 39 of those 41 patients where their surgical lung biopsies could be reobtained they were reclassified under current guidelines of not just pulmonary fibrosis, but did they have usual interstitial pneumonia or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia? What we can see is that 90% of the NSIP patients were responders or stable, and only one patient worsened. However, within the usual interstitial pneumonia, over half of the patients were non-responders. So what we could see from this subcategorization of UIP and NSIP is we could then break out patients that were more likely to respond to steroid therapy. And that led us to where we are now. So historically, we grouped lots of things together. We then realized that within those large groups, there were subsets. And within those subsets, response to therapy and prognosis seemed to be different, led to our current approach, which is a very high emphasis on diagnosis. This is important. It helps us determine our initial therapy. It helps us predict at the time of diagnosis what the prognosis may be. I believe it's likely helped with success in IPF clinical trials by getting rid of some of the heterogeneity. However, as we'll point out, it does fail to account for subsequent disease behavior. So now we group the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias into several different subcategories, the largest of which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Other categories include NSIP, acute interstitial pneumonia, RBILD, DIP, or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Even within this diagnostic classification, this paper, it started to highlight that based on the diagnosis, 
we could predict what the disease behavior may be. So some of these were felt to be more chronic in fibrosing, such as IPF or NSIP. Some we thought were more epidemiologically based or smoking related, such as RBILD or DIP. And some were more acute or subacute, such as organized pneumonia or acute interstitial pneumonia. So even at this time when we were really starting to focus on getting an accurate diagnosis in subclassifying patients, we were pointing out that those diagnoses seem to behave in certain features, with some being more chronic and fibrosing and others being more acute or subacute. By looking at the baseline diagnosis, we can define prognosis. Patients with usual interstitial pneumonia compared to NSIP or RBILD, DIP have a much worse survival over time. And that's even when you account for other variables apart from the diagnosis, such as physiology, onset of symptoms, or fibrosis on CT scan. It's really the diagnosis at baseline, even when accounting for these other features, that drives prognosis. However, if we look at what happens after that diagnosis, what really seems to be even more important is disease behavior. In this study by Jigal, published in 2005, what we saw here is that once you accounted for a six-month change in forced vital capacity, which that six-month change correlated with long-term survival, the baseline diagnosis of NSIP or IPF was no longer significant, arguing that at the time of diagnosis, the diagnosis that you assign is critically important, IPF versus NSIP. However, further down the road, after therapy has been assigned, it's the disease course not the initial diagnosis that defines subsequent prognosis. And that may be where we get in the future, moving from historically where things were grouped together to currently with a large emphasis on diagnosis to the future where we may take into account after initial diagnosis, what is the disease behavior? Is it progressing? Is it stable? Or did it respond to our initial therapy? And certainly there are other diseases where the phenotype is treated more than the diagnosis. We can see that in pulmonary hypertension, where many different things can lead to pulmonary hypertension, although the therapies we use are similar. Or we can look at it in terms of malignancies, where you can see certain mutations that cause malignancies in many different organs. And it's not the organ's cancer that's treated, it's the mutation or the product of mutation that's treated regardless of where the cancer arises. So in the future, we may start looking at phenotypes after diagnosis and not just diagnosis. And we can try to look at that conceptually where you could have a large group of patients in the center showing progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. On the outside, there would be patients that have stable or improved lung function. And within overlapping circles, we could see different diseases. For example, IPF, which for the most part is a progressive disease. So most of those patients would be in the progressive fibrosing phenotype, although there are some patients that do seem to respond to therapy. With NSIP, some patients respond to therapies, although others have a progressive fibrotic phenotype. If you look at all these different diseases individually, they would be too small to study. There aren't enough progressive fibrotic NSIP patients or patients with hypersensitivity pneumonia or unclassifiable, leading to the idea that perhaps we could study the phenotype of progressive fibrosis across different diseases as opposed to studying individual diseases. Along those lines, I'd like to try to draw a few parallels between non-IPF interstitial lung diseases that seem to have a progressive phenotype and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's these similarities that lead us to think that if we study antifibrotic medicines in diseases other than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they may also have efficacy. We'll review the hypothesis that beyond the trigger, once fibrosis is established, antifibrotic therapy might work in progressive cases parallels can be seen in connective tissue disease. In this study, we looked at survival in patients with interstitial lung disease or connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease. The majority of these patients had rheumatoid arthritis, and we know that the histopathology that's most commonly seen in rheumatoid arthritis is usual interstitial pneumonia. So it's not surprising that the survival curves between these patients with cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis, which histopathologically would show UIP, was very similar to the connective tissue disease patients, which we would also have expected to have histopathologically usual interstitial pneumonia. We can also look at it in terms of CT appearance. This series of nearly 100 patients with rheumatoid arthritis-associated interstitial lung disease had CTs classified by showing a pattern of UIP, NSIP, indeterminate, or other, and when these patients were looked at in terms of prognosis, either by CT phenotype or compared to IPF, the RA patients with UIP 
behaved almost identically in terms of survival to IPF. And if you just looked at the CT features, those patients with a CT of UIP had a worse prognosis compared to those that were indeterminate or those that had NSIP. We can also look at this in terms of histopathology. This large series of histopathologic patterns in patients with rheumatoid arthritis shows that apart from diffuse alveolar damage, a pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia has a worse prognosis than other types of histopathology, such as NSIP, bronchiolitis, or other things, showing that within patients with rheumatoid arthritis, a histopathologic pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia has a progressive phenotype that is very similar to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And much like we have exacerbations of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you can also see exacerbations within rheumatoid arthritis-associated interstitial lung disease. So a lot of similarities between connective tissue disease, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If we shift gears and look at another type of interstitial lung disease, we can look at hypersensitivity pneumonia. Hypersensitivity pneumonia can come in different varieties. It can present acutely or it can be more chronic and fibrotic. In this case example, there was a 50-year-old patient who had hypersensitivity pneumonia recognized early. There were doves that were causing this. We can see that at presentation in 2013, the lung function was extremely compromised with an FEV1 of 50% of predicted, forced vital capacity of 38% of predicted, and DLCO of 38% of predicted. And the HRCT scan at that time shows a predominance of ground glass opacification, but no significant fibrosis. The doves were removed from the environment, the patient was treated with immunosuppression, and responded to therapy. In looking at 2016, the FTC has improved to 61%, the diffusion capacity improved to 81%, and the ground glass opacification that was initially present on the CT has resolved, and beyond that, there is no fibrosis. So in this patient, the diagnosis was made, treatment was rendered, and the patient responded. The patient did not have progressive fibrosis. Unfortunately, with some cases of hypersensitivity pneumonia, fibrosis does become established. That's shown in this patient, who now has more chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia, where we can see areas of bronchiectasis and scarring and mosaic attenuation. Unfortunately, even with removing the antigen from this environment and treating with aggressive immunosuppression, this patient continued to progress and eventually died from respiratory failure. If we look at histopathologic patterns within hypersensitivity pneumonia, there are some that show features of UIP, others NSIP, and others organizing pneumonia or cellular NSIP. And much like we see with the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or rheumatoid arthritis or connective tissue diseases, those patients with a usual interstitial pneumonia feature have a worse prognosis. This could be simplified even further and just looking not at the pattern of UIP, but is there or is there not fibrosis on the biopsy? is more than 5% of a surface area on a single slide showing fibrosis. That was the study question in this group of patients with hypersensitivity pneumonia. In this group of patients with hypersensitivity pneumonia, 46 of them had fibrotic HP defined by more than 5% surface area on a single slide showing mature collagen. 26 had non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonia. And when you looked at their survival, those that had even a small amount, 5% fibrosis on a slide, their prognosis was poor compared to those without any fibrosis. What did those fibrotic patients look like by CT scan? Well, they showed patterns on CT that we would expect with fibrosis. Those fibrotic patients had usual interstitial pneumonia, had honeycombing, had traction bronchiectasis. The patients without fibrosis on CT did not have a UIP pattern, did not have honeycombing, and did not have traction bronchiectasis. And when you looked at the survival by fibrotic features of CT or non-fibrotic, as expected, those patients that showed features of fibrosis had a worse prognosis. We can look at more recent data with much larger numbers of patients, 119 patients with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia, again telling a similar theme, that if you have a pattern of UIP compared to NSIP or others, your prognosis is poor, or if you just look at other features, such as patients with fibroblastic foci, which are thought to be responsible for laying down the fibrosis, or those just with established fibrosis on biopsy, those patients have a worse prognosis. They progress and have a higher mortality than those without fibrosis or without patterns such as usual interstitial pneumonia. And much like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or rheumatoid arthritis, these patients can have acute exacerbations. So what I've tried to do is draw a number of parallels between some types of interstitial lung disease and IPF. Similar to IPF, we can see patterns of UIP, and it's that UIP or fibrotic pattern that seems to correlate with a worse prognosis. 
We can also see disease behaviors such as exacerbations that occur not just in IPF, but can occur related to connective tissue disease or chronic hypersensitivity and ammonia. If we look at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and the pathobiology of that disease, it's often described as an abnormal wound healing model where there's recurring micro injuries that occur to a patient, perhaps with the right genetic background that eventually leads to a process that doesn't heal, but has progressive scarring. The idea with progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease is that even if we know the cause of the micro-injury, we know there's an antigen with hypersensitive pneumonia, or we know there's an underlying autoimmune disease, perhaps in some of those patients, when fibrosis progresses, they may actually behave much like IPF as opposed to non-IPF idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Leading to several potential hypotheses, and these are just hypotheses that need to be tested. But one is that perhaps immunosuppressive therapy is effective early in the pre-fibrotic phases of diseases that are not IPF, such as acute hypersensitivity pneumonia, or early in the disease process of connective tissue disease and interstitial lung disease. However, once fibrosis is present, immunosuppressive therapy may no longer be effective. And in fact, some wonder that it may be harmful, such as it is in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what needs to be tested is antifibrotic therapy. Perhaps agents such as perfenidone, natinidib, or other emerging agents may ameliorate the decline in lung function in non-IPF fibrotic ILDs, especially when a UIP pattern is present. Now, there are several studies that are ongoing looking at these antifibrotic agents in non-IPF diseases. There are clinical trials going on with natinidib. There's a study looking at this in lymphangiomyomatosis and also a study in patients with progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease. These PFILD patients do not have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but have other types of interstitial lung disease, such as that associated with autoimmune disease, hypersensitivity pneumonia, or other things that have progressive fibrosis defined by worsening symptoms, worsening physiology, or worsening fibrotic change on serial CT scans. There are also several trials looking at perfenidone. The TRAIL study is a phase two study of perfenidone in patients with rheumatoid arthritis-associated interstitial lung disease. There's also a study of perfenidone in patients with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonia and unclassifiable progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. Studies are ongoing with natinidib and scleroderma. And with perfenidone, the LOTUS study was a phase two trial looking at safety and tolerability in patients with systemic sclerosis-associated interstitial lung disease. And there's also an ongoing trial called the Scleroderma Lung Study 3, a phase two study combining perfenidone with mycophenolate. In terms of the LOTUS study, the results were published and did show that the tolerability of perfenidone in patients with systemic sclerosis was very similar to that of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There were a fair number of side effects throughout the trial, and the types of side effects, such as nausea, were very similar to the side effects that were seen in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, leading to the thought that these antifibrotic therapies will likely have similar side effects and hopefully safety profiles in non-IPF interstitial lung diseases. But again, the efficacy studies are ongoing, and as such, there is no indication or approval to use either perfenidone or natinidib outside of those patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So in conclusion, what I've tried to do is walk through where we started in terms of diagnosis of interstitial lung diseases. Initially, we grouped large numbers of patients together, but this led to subsets within those groups that behaved differently. That led to our current emphasis on diagnosis, where at the time of diagnosis, we can better assign therapy and prognosis, but also realizing that that baseline diagnosis often fails to account for subsequent disease behavior. And once we know what the disease behavior is, responding to therapy versus getting worse with therapy, it's that response to therapy, that prognosis, that course of the disease that seems to subsequently correlate with disease behavior, leading to the idea that perhaps outside of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, there are groups of different diseases that have a progressive fibrosing phenotype. And studying that progressive fibrosing phenotype with drugs that work with IPF, such as metenidum, perfenidone, and others that hopefully will emerge, may show that in patients with non-IPF progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease, they may also have a response to therapy. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash FMH. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals Incorporated.